Okay, today I'm joined by Martin Moore Eid. Um, Martin was a uh, professor that professor that led the research in in Harvard back in the, in the 70s and 80s uh, that found the the human biological clock in our brains um, called the SCN. Uh, this is governed by light, um, and you know light has a huge help in implications uh, through this. And and the, uh, since his research in the 70s and 80s, like um, we've had another 30, 40 years of research, and 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 uh, it's it's incredibly solid now and the evidence is incredibly incredibly sort of uh, um copper fastened in terms of um where it's at and, and and maybe some of the detrimental effects that that we're having from artificial light um the nobel prize was won in 2017 for for circadian biology so it's um and and it's it it has massive implications right across anything from heart disease diabetes and um mental health uh, and cancer so it's 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 very wide ranging um we're going to be talking a lot about it coming in in the next while because because it is so uh so important and it very much relates to artificial light um one or two technical technical pieces we talk about when we talk about colors of light white light is made up of all the colors of the rainbow so the different colors have different effects on us and that very much ties into our circadian biology and how, how it affects our biological clocks. Um, when we talk about nanometers, a nanometer is is a wavelength uh, of light, and that really relates to a color. So it's another word for you know a color of light. But uh, just to get those two, one or two, don't let those little technical pieces throw you. I think it's an incredibly interesting discussion, and Martin is incredibly knowledgeable. And um, yeah, a great way to maybe give people a good insight into how artificial light is, is affecting us and uh, and where the science is at, at at the moment. Couldn't think of anyone better to maybe take us on the journey of where, um, I suppose, where this research started, where it's at now, and maybe we, we can look at wh where we can go in terms of trying to come up with some, you know, um, evolve our design and our a light understanding to, to create better environments. I, um, so maybe to start, Martin, you could kick off and 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 maybe give us an introduction to how um um I suppose a a, a UK man or a Brit, a Brit ended up in in Harvard in 1975 leading the the team that discovered the SNC. SCN, yeah. SCN, sorry, SCN. <laughs> I don't want to correct you too much, but the super no. is got in nucleus, right? Co yeah. Cor correct so the away, Martin. Part. I'm I'm here to learn, and um yeah. <laughs> So we start with the basics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I uh, grew up in England, um, in uh, just outside London in Surrey, and uh, went to medical school, the Guy's Hospital Medical School. Um, along the way, I did a uh, uh, bachelor's in physiology at the University of College London, um, and then went on through after medical school. Uh, I actually came over to the North America first to Toronto, uh, where I was a surgical resident. Uh, tra in training, um, and that reinforced my whole interest because I was up for 36 hours straight um, under bright fluorescent lights, that uh, blue-rich fluorescent lights at that time. Uh, my sleep was all scrambled. I was making, I was fatigued half the time, making uh, falling asleep in the operating room, uh, writing prescriptions I couldn't make sense of the next day. And I got really said, I, I'm going to take a detour out of surgery. Um, and I'm going to actually study this whole thing about why time of day and circadian rhythms were very new topic at that end at that time. In fact, I was advised by my professors that it was really um, this was a hokey subject and really there was nothing there and I should avoid uh, devoting my career to it. I ignored them, fortunately. Um, but uh, I did a PhD at Harvard and then joined the Harvard Medical School faculty and professor of physiology. Um, and let, developed a team there to really understand what was going on. And one of the things we did was identified, located in the human brain where the biological clock was. People didn't think humans had a biological clock. Uh, There's a little cluster of nerve cells in the brain um, um, or just above the optic nerves that go back from the eye. It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. We'll just call it SCN from now on because that's much simpler. Yeah. Um, we figured out, and also another thing that people were saying at that time was, you know, humans are not synchronized by light and dark. It's some form of social interaction, but light and dark doesn't synchronize. All other species are synchronized by light and dark mm -hmm. to day and night. 
Um, and we then demonstrated, no, that was not true. It, humans are synchronized by light, uh, particularly light in the mornings, keeps your clock in sync. And um, so light and dark is very important. And along the way, we also started figuring out all the medical conditions that are um, caused when you disrupt that. And so um, basically, and this is a brand new thing for the lighting industry, because the lighting industry has all been about uh, delivering visual illumination. In other words, you know, the, the quality of the illumination, the quality of um, the ability to, you know, do tasks, uh, it's all measured in, you know, lumens and lux mm. and lumens per watt are the sort of metrics that the lighting industry used. What you don't realize, uh, most people don't realize, is that lumens and lux um, are all about yellow and green wavelengths. They were the ones, because it's all about, that's the, how the human eye seems brightness. Yeah. So all these yeah. metrics that we use and all the, and now we're focused on lumens per watt. In other words, how much bright light can we create mm -hmm. for every watt of electricity? And that's what's driven the LED revolution because you get very high numbers of lumens per watt. But they don't measure the healthy parts of light spectrum. And as you know, um, you know, white light is not real, right? White light is a blend of all the other colors of the, of the colors of the rainbow. So we perceive it as white light, but it's a mixture between all these different colors. So we have in that color spectrum, just like the rainbow, we have violet, we have blue, uh, we have green, we have yellow, we have orange, we have red. And together, we see it as white. Lumens per watt just measures the yellow and green parts of it only. Mm. Really. Okay. Very little. Okay. The, the blue part of it and the red part of it, which are essential to human health, are not measured by that. So is that because is that yeah. because the original sorry, you're cutting across here, but the original research then was just based yeah, as you're saying, it was just based on visual acuity, really. It wasn't based yeah. on Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. The whole thing is visual acuity. If you want brightness, yeah. if you want to see, because you're most sensitive to about 555 nanometers in the green, you know, but it's green and yellow wavelengths predominantly yeah. make up that measurement. So what you're really saying is um, my, this light bulb that's got a very high LE, in a lumens per watt, it's at well over 100 um, lumens per watt, this, uh, this, this light bulb here, right? For, okay. It's a cheap LED light bulb now. Um, but all I care about is how much yellow and green light it comes in. Well, that makes no sense. We actually need to care about how much blue, because mm. all the health concerns are to do with the blue or the red part of the spectrum. So the blue part of the spectrum is what, in fact, we now know is what is the signal for the circadian clock. And so yeah. what we did along the way was we identified um, first of all, just tell the story a little bit. Um, I got back into this issue. We discovered the clock at Harvard in the 1980s, and we'd um, discovered how it worked and so forth. But at that time, we just thought it was any light. It was unsophisticated about this. I just any white light would do it, right, would be important. But around 2000, everything changed. Several different major findings happened. Number one, there was discovery of a pigment called melanopsin, which is in specialized cells in the eye that are not the rods and cones, that is detecting light around 480 nanometers in the blue, right? That's number one. Number yeah. two, they um, discovered, so the, the sensitivity to the, the circadian system and melatonin is all in the blue part of the spectrum. And uh, then, at the same time, all the data was starting to come out showing that cancer rates, breast cancer rates, were 50% higher in people who were exposed to light at night, like nurses working the night shift, 50% more breast cancer. And then as, as we looked further at that, uh, obesity was much higher, diabetes, heart disease, in people exposed to light at night. But it's the blue-rich light at night that's the problem. Yeah. So to cut to the end of the story, right, what you need is to have bright blue light during the daytime, particularly in the mornings. Get outside in bright daylight would be the perfect way, it's the perfect way to do it. But you need blue rich light in the mornings because that stabilizes your circadian clock and your sleep wake and everything else. But as soon as the sun sets, you want to get rid of all the blue. But the problem is what we, you know, 
we didn't, Edison, Thomas Edison didn't give us much blue. It was only 4% blue in those incandescent light bulbs. So we didn't get too much blue. We did get some blue light uh, from the um, Edison. But as soon as we go to these LED light bulbs, we're getting 15%, sometimes 20% of the light is actually blue. Mm. Um, and that's because the most efficient way to make LED light that has the highest lumens per watt is you use a blue pump. It's in the royal blue range, about 450 nanometers. And that is, um, you know, it, and everyone's focused on energy efficiency. But the problem is we've now banned incandescence in, in yeah. North America. I, I don't know, are they banned yet in England? Yeah, they, they're banned here as well. Yeah, they're banned here Ireland. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, yeah. and in Europe, in, in, so they're generally banned, and yeah. um, so now we've replaced low blue light with high blue light, and we've got a whole host of problems. So the long, the list yeah. is long. It's obesity, diabetes, heart disease, breast cancer, prostate cancer, depression, um, anxiety, um, it, all sorts of issues are related to getting the wrong light at the wrong time, but yeah. the lighting industry is only just beginning to ad address it, right? And so, um, but my history goes back to saying, okay, with face of the problem, I, it was about 2007 when the World Health Organization came out and saying, yes, breast cancer is caused by exposure to light at night. Um, and that was a big finding. And I, at that time, was consulting to industry at a consulting firm that was uh, working with half the Fortune 500 all the types of companies that work 24 seven around the clock. And what I did at that time was they came to me and they said, Martin, you know, what are we gonna do? The World Health Organization says, these lights at night are causing cancer in our people, but we can't switch the lights off at night. Um, we can't stop the business, you know, lots of things, whether it's an offshore oil rig or a, a manufacturing plant or, you know, a hospital, you can't switch off the lights. What do we do? And the answer was there was nothing available to solve that. And so I then set up what is called the Circadian Light Research Center in Boston to really uh, tackle that problem. We got government funds and other funds to do this, investor funds as well to do this. And we set out to find out, can we find a solution? And the real thing we needed to know was, okay, what is the precise blue wavelengths that we need to control? Um, and secondly was how much the dose of blue that you need to have during the day and not have at night. And um, cut a long story short, we identified that actually um, the dose is around 480 nanometers. It's a sky blue color. It's quite a narrow band of that sky blue that's causing the problem. Yeah. And that gave us then the solutions. We in fact wrote the patents on it that gave us the rights to this. And this has actually enabled us to get money to start developing lights properly. But the um, this sky blue color, uh, you need it in the daytime, you know, and you need high intensity of it during the daytime. But during the nighttime hours, so after sunset, you need to get rid of it. And so mm -hmm. you've got to have sort of zero blue light. Um, and that was the question, of how do you do that? Um, one way is you can get rid of all the all the short wavelengths, and then you end up with a very yellow-orange color. That's one way of doing it. That That's a valid way of doing it. Yeah. Very low CCT light, you know, 1500 CCT type of light. For it's like our, like our candle light or our, our old sort of fire. fire yeah, fire light. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Fire yeah. light. Yeah, they, yeah. The, yeah, going back, Willie, you're right. But it's came, essentially, though, this problem, right? It is, it's essentially, um, and it's something that has always that's struck me for, for, for quite a while, but and uh, as I said, I'm, I'm following your 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 Substack, uh, the Light Doctor, which is really interesting. But um, I think you talk about it in one of some of the opening chapters, like in terms of look, we've evolved, we've evolved outside, um, you know, um, for what you know, three billion years or something like this, and uh, three or four hundred thousand years as as human beings. But and we've evolved under this day and night cycle, and and it's really um, we're we're nearly trying to. The, the the impression I get are, are trying to approach it, understand it, you know, from a light and design perspective. But 
like daylight is the healthiest, isn't it? Like just for everybody, like daylight changes color temperature naturally throughout the day. And, and that's that's what we're trying to, I suppose, what you're trying to replicate um, and maybe try to minimize the harms that we're causing in the evening. And and it was that fireside and it was that sort of candlelight was really all we had in the evening, I suppose, for uh, thousands of years, really, wasn't it? Yeah. And so and we've fortuitously um, firelight, candlelight, those sort of pre-electric lights have virtually no blue, less than 1% yeah. blue content, right? Yeah. And so um, as a result, we, you know, that's not a problem. It doesn't, you know, that that the, that does not disturb um, our circadian rhythms, our, the cycles of sleep and wake and all the other hormone and other things in the body that are going yeah. on. So that's great. And then, of course, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb that made it possible for people to stay up at night that started the problem going, but um, the, he actually, his light bulbs, I say, have less than, you know, around 4% blue. It was a bit more blue yeah. than firelight, but today's LEDs are pumping out way more blue. Yeah. And what we don't realize is we're creating a huge amount of harm with these LED lights. Um, and as a, you know, as a, and so that basically we need to switch over to what we call circadian lighting which provides blue during the day and takes away the blue at night, but yeah. less than less than 0.2% of lighting sold today is circadian lighting. So yeah. we're, we've got and, a big catch up here. And even some of the some of the lighting, it's you know it, it'll change color temperature like tunable white, but it's it's not doing the same thing. It's it's uh, it's it's not, I suppose, um, zeroing in or or focused on that. That's uh, the important sort of what is it four four seventy five nanometers or something yeah, like that right. blue sky blue light yeah 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 because again it's, again when I came across it first it was okay well tunable white maybe this can you know um, well there's two things tunable white will change color temperature just like daylight will change color temperature um, I was always worried because daylight is so much brighter you know you're fifty thousand lux as opposed to what we have inside um, that you know you're you're going to find it hard to re replicate that. But I think what you've pinpointed is is the fact that it's not um, it's not providing the right way. It's really down to the spectrum down to the spectrum that is providing at the at the time of the day. That's quite important, right. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, the CCT is really a placebo issue, right? Yeah. The color temperature, the coordinated color temperature CCT. Um, that is people uh, promoted that and uh, as the solution. But unfortunately, CCT is very weakly related to the amount of blue. So that you can actually, I, I've got light bulbs that I've created lights, and others have too, where the same, exactly the same color temperature, right? But 20 times more blue in one than the other with the same color temperature. So it's independent, you know, the CCT yeah. and, and the blueness is almost semi-independent. Now, it's true, if you stay on the, that black body line, in other words, that um, that standard they use in the industry, um, yeah. you get, you know, basically um, uh, at, at a color temperature of 4,000, you're probably up about 14% blue, and you get down, by the time you get down to about 2,700 Kelvin, uh, you're about... Um, 8% uh, blue, but it's still way, way too much blue. In other words, it, yeah. it does drop as you go down the color temperature thing, but not yeah. nearly enough. So it's much better. What we've done is look at the whole issue of, and others are doing spectral engineering, which is actually, beauty about LEDs is you can design them to emit exactly the spectrum you want. In other words, you can choose your gamut or your color spectrum and build it so it's either rich in the blue or weak in the blue or zero blue, and you can and you can then balance out the colors and produce a reasonably sort of um, white yellowish light, um, you know, a comfortable looking light, a warm light that does the trick. But um, yeah, it's um, but meanwhile the industry is churning out um, increasingly yeah. brighter, increasingly cheaper uh, LEDs, and um, that is a that's the problem we're trying to reverse. like the problem is getting worse really isn't it and yeah. and and as 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 led and you can see it even now and and i i remember myself as i said i i came across the circadian research in 2009 and it probably was a couple of years after you said that the, the who and i had seen those those studies on on breast cancer and and light at night being carcinogenic um and 
I, look, you're you're so busy. I think that's probably with with a lot of people. You're so busy with so many different parameters that people are trying to address in in their in their business or in their profession. That 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 it's sort of it, to me. I thought, God, this is going to be big. And then I'd heard, well, the science isn't just here. And then I, I sort of, you know, you move on. And next thing, ten years has gone by, <laughs> and you look right. at it again. But but. I was really promoting um, the likes of the, the street light LEDs and much whiter light at night time because, you know, color rendering is much better and people would feel much safer in, in exterior spaces and it'll be better for crime. Um, I know we have that. Look, we we evolved under the day night cycle. Nature evolved under that daylight night cycle. Uh, the exterior lighting is causing quite an issue now as well, isn't it? That blue LED at night time is not yeah. causing just an issue for us, but for the rest of the rest of the environment. Yeah, no, I mean, if you think about uh, the impact on, I, I, there are two, two, two problems, right? In the indoor world, in our own indoors, we're entitled to design light that's perfect for humans, right? That's what we need to design. And because our human health is all we're really concerned about, maybe our pets and our house plants, but basically human. Mm. But outside, there are 8.7 million species living in nature that are extremely sensitive to light. And a big city like Dublin, you can see the sky glow from 50 miles away, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's the yeah. sort of thing that is put now. And that pollution, it has huge effects on all the parts of the food chain, on plants and how they grow, on caterpillars, on songbirds. I mean, songbirds have dropped in population uh, by 90%. Um, yeah, it's crazy. You know, because because of the impact and, of that yeah. environmental impact of light and and other things we put in our environment. And it's like insect populations as well. I think like it's it's, the, it's yeah. across the board, isn't it? Obviously, yeah. you know, if it's affecting insects, it's affecting it's it's a whole ecosystem, isn't it? You know, yeah. so it's all interlinked. Yeah. Um. No, it's 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 fascinating, and it's it's sort of like one thing that like let's say that the research that that you. And it sort of were initially like evolved in in Harvard it was 1975, and it seems like again as when I came across it in 2009, that's what 30 years or more after that, and 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 it's still we're another 14 years gone from 2009. <laughs> why? No, why are we? Yeah, there's because it's such a big issue, and it's 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 like I. We're talking about it quite a bit now over the last, you know, what, what three, four, five months, and we're, we're really trying to. But it's something that we we really honed in on because it's the it, the issue is is so big when you start to break it down with we you know with, with with different types of cancers. Um, I th I think it's um, there's mental health and diabetes. There's a whole range of yes. different. Why hasn't the message do you think landed with the lighting industry or even the general public? Um, it's it's sort of crazy when it's you know, the science is rock solid, really, at the moment, isn't it? Right. Well, the science is rock solid. And one of the first things is the lighting industry has said, well, um, partly out of convenience, they've claimed, well, the science is not really solid or proven yet. So, um, yeah. you know, we'll wait until it's all known, right? Mm. Uh, to address that, I did a, a, a project with invited 250 of the world's leading scientists in this area working on circadian rhythms and light and all the rest of it right and i pulled them and um they all we reached consensus on that this science was solid you know that the it does light at night blue rich light at night um does uh, cause breast cancer and diabetes and obesity and heart disease that in fact uh we need to reduce the content of blue we need low blue light um in the evening hours um, and rich blue light during the daytime. Uh, and specifically, they said that these modern LEDs that are being used should actually carry a warning label, may be harmful to your health if used at night, right? Yeah. So, and so I did that because I would keep saying, well, you know, Dr. Marie, this is your opinion, you know, um, but it's the science is not proven. I say, no, it's proven. And so, I got 250 of the world's leading scientists that came out this year, um, a, a paper, and uh, it's got quite a pickup. Um, but that was really addressing that problem, that number one thing, the excuse, right? Yeah. The second thing is, oh, we've got a solution here. Uh, we got we can do change the color of lights or change the color temperature of lights, and um, changing around the time of day. Um, that is a pure placebo. Um, 
uh, unless you go to really big extremes. I mean, you could go down to really orange yellow light in 1500 Kelvin on one end and 7000 Kelvin on the other, and you could then get the circadian benefit, but then you have the problem of harsh bluish white light, which is uncomfortable to work under during the day, yeah. and something where you can't very really see very well under the yellow orange at night. But you can do that. That, that could work. The other is that the um, is the supply problem because the on the other hand, the companies that started making it these lights have had a hard time breaking into the market um, mm. because of demand. So there is the whole consumer awareness. So it's yeah. a supply, you've got to have a supply and you've got to have demand, right? Mm. And the problem is that people who purchase lights are typically not the people who are directly affected by those lights. So the building manager, the building owner, the investor in the building, et cetera, you know, uh, um, the facilities manager, you know, buying lights um, is not really focused on the health and well-being of the people. He's focused on how do I get the uh, lowest electricity bill um, and how do I get lights that are cheapest I can put in to keep my budget low, right? And that's true yeah. for architecture and, and for new buildings as well as retrofits. So um, the people who are concerned don't, aren't aware of the problem. Yeah, so yeah. in other words, and that's the big message, you know, how do you get people aware of, of the problem so they demand light that yeah. is zero blue at night and is rich in blue during the day? Um, and then, you know, and, and then the companies have to provide it. And so th these products yeah. are starting to come on the market now but it's a supply and demand problem. Um, that it's a, it's an awareness. Yeah. Sorry, awareness. I'm cutting across you there. It's awareness, really, Martin, isn't it? Like yeah, it's sort yeah. of. Um, I, I was pushing one of our manufacturers recently, and um, just chatting to him about circadian lighting. He's going, "Yeah, look, again, the level of knowledge, and 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 you'd be surprised with the level of knowledge and and the level of understanding in the lighting industry." But um, his thing was, "Look, we just we just don't have a demand. Nobody's pushing for it, type of thing. Yeah, you know, it's." That's right. Um, and that looked at uh, they respond to the demand and they respond to where 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 uh, yeah what their consumers are looking for you know but it was has it been frustrating from your pr perspective that maybe you know you've been sort of it's been well, you know it's taken such a, t a time type of thing we have to explain it and that's why I've written the light doctor which as you mentioned mm. is um uh, released on Substack um, and is um, fr you know freely available um, because I want to write a book that could explain it to the general public, uh, you know, for people of their own interest, what light they should care about the light in their homes because it really is affecting their health. They should care about the light in their workplaces and in hospitals and in other places. Um, and but people need to be armed with the facts and be told, you know, part of what I'm doing is coaching people how to persuade you know your your business owner or your building manager or whatever that you need better lighting to improve your health and performance um productivity is higher uh in hospitals patients can be admitted uh, you know who admitted into hospital can be discharged earlier if they are under healthy circadian lighting um the staff uh, turnover is down people's um sleep is better you know, and we've actually done that now. We put it in uh, uh, 65 different places ourselves, uh, circadian lighting. I uh, got great results in terms of alertness, performance, improvement of sleep, um, and um, you know, improvements in uh, digestive problems that people have when they work at night. Um, all sorts of things as a result of that. So the data is there, and it's an awareness problem. Right. And yeah. this is why it's great yeah. to be able to talk to you. And hopefully we can, you know, we can get this out through social media. But we got to get yeah, it's, the message. It's it's trying to um, because it's trying to really come up with it. Like. From a health perspective, like what, what we're trying to do with what I get from from an artificial lighting perspective really is is to reinforce that circadian rhythm, like basically just just from a science, just to, to get back to, to dig into the science a little bit more. So the, the SN, the SCN, the right. SCN, yes. Um, there's receptors in our eye that that that's um, as well as see as 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 uh, as visual receptors. I think it's melanopsin, is it? That that that's in the eye that that 
photoreceptors that send a signal to the SCN based on the time of the day, the type of light that's coming into your eyes, telling telling your body what time of the day it is as such. That's right. Um, so what we got is the light, you know, the light is received by the eyes. It's and there are two functions in our eyes. One is the rods and cones, which are to do with our visual perception, how we can see actually things and have vision. But in between those rods and cones, and particularly the bottom half of the eye down here, yeah. there are um, cells called retinal ganglion cells or IPRGCs. That means intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells is the is the technical name for them. But they contain this photopigment called melanopsin, which is highly sensitive to blue light. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that it's 20, you know, if you shine white light on the eye, you need to be 25 times brighter with white light than with blue light. In other words, it's 25 times more sensitive to blue than to the regular rest of the spectrum. That signal goes then up a pathway directly to this clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. And in turn, that sends out, keeps time in the body, and it's it's like the master um, conductor of the orchestra, because every all the cells in our body, all the tissues in our body, have their own circadian clocks. And they all have to be kept in synchrony with each other, because if we get out of step, the, the rhythm of the liver and the rhythm of the heart and the rhythm of the um, you know, pancreas and the other organs of the kidneys are out of step with each other. That results in very serious ill health. So yeah. we've got to keep the whole thing in system. And what helps is a messenger hormone called melatonin that is actually coming out of the pineal gland that's in the brain. It's a special gland in the brain. And that pineal gland is triggered by the absence of blue light, or at least it's very sensitive to blue light. And so when it's dark outside in nature, melatonin rises to a peak in the body. And melatonin is not the sleep hormone. Sometimes people call it the sleep hormone. It's actually the um, darkness hormone. It is the signal to the body that it's dark outside. And that's a key synchronizer hormone in the body. It also suppresses cancer cells and all sorts of very important things that melatonin does. It does a lot of repair work at nighttime, yeah, doesn't it? Or exactly. Like that. A lot of repair, yeah. repair, recovery, immune system. So if you mess with that, in other words, if you see, you know, get you shine a bright light from a, um, you know, an LED light bulb, right? That's or a mobile phone, blue. mobile phone or a screen. <laughs> mobile phone screen, you're pumping this blue light in, you're suppressing the melatonin, you're turning the body, it's light outside, you're confusing, you know, the different tissues of the body, you're driving, you're, you're preventing the normal repair processes at night. Um, you're really doing a lot of harm and it's also disrupting your mental health. As I say, people get much more, 30% 30, 30 more depression. Now you can say, well, what if, how big are these effects? All right, you've got, well, the, the problem is, um, I mean, one amazing statistic is that 40 to 50% of adults sleep with the lights on at night. Staggering yeah. statistic. Yeah. And if that is blue rich light you're sleeping, then what happens is they doubles the rates of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, um, not to mention cancer risk. And you can say, well, what's the long-term effect of that? Well, if you compare people who sleep with the lights on at night versus the sleep in the dark, as they should, those people, if they look at a group of 60-year-olds, in fact, there's a big biobank study in London, in, in England, looking at 85,000 people, a huge number of people, those that slept in the dark lived 30% longer than oh, those who were in uh, sleeping in the light. And this is a bunch of 60 year olds. And it's, it's crazy. And, it, and if you add to that, if you add to that, like um, that we spend 93% of our time indoors, so we're not getting out in the daylight during the day either. Like there's been yeah. a lot of studies saying that being out in the daylight and getting sunlight, which has been sort of vilified so much, is people live longer because of that as well, isn't it? Isn't oh, it? yeah, they absolutely yeah. do. I mean, a big yeah. study, 29,000 Swedish women were tracked over multiple years, prospectively, and they looked at how much time did they spend outside, right? And the people who spent outside lived much longer than those who lived indoors all the time. 
And the size of the effect was the size of whether you smoked or not. It was the equivalent size effect of smoking living inside as opposed to outside, right? So a huge, huge effects. It just, it just one thing that drives it home, drives home to me, and something. It, it just we're living in quite an artificial, like the, the environment that we're living in. I've, I've heard an analogy before. Is sort of that we developed in this environment for however long, as I said, and we, we, we sort of evolved to be outside, and, and we're, we've created a very artificial environment that it's like putting a plant that's designed for the sun in the shade or something like that, isn't it? You know, it's sort of, yeah. it's not going to thrive really, yeah. No, I totally, totally right. It's um, it, it's it's a huge issue, and it's time now to fix. It. We now know the good news is we know how to fix it. Now, it's like unlike most environmental challenges, right? Environmental pollutants, chemicals, the PFAS chemicals, you know, for example, that are in you know toxic chemicals, they're a heck of a thing to clean up. Very expensive to clean up, um, and long lasting, and all the rest of it. This environmental challenge is so simple. You just turn off the damn lights, right, mm, um, yeah. at night, all right, or you don't, you know, and you you get out in the daytime. Um, this is so simple to fix, you know, it, it, it and it's instantaneous. Uh, furthermore, if you turn off the lights, you know, when you or not use lights that are unhealthy, um, that's saving you money. It's not costing you money. Um, yeah. In addition. So it, it's it is a um, it's something on the edge of um, uh, with the solutions out there. The light bulbs are coming available, and, and the light. And by the way, it's not a light bulbs. Also, you know, regular commercial office fixtures are coming out in January. There's a whole set of them now, and the Lumen series that's coming out. Um, those sort of things that automatically switch between blue rich days and zero blue nights, right, or evenings. Or, or totally automatically programmed, those sort of lights are, um, you know, available. So the question is, how do we get people aware of this? Because it's, you know, the science is there, the solutions are available, um, and, um, you know, and there's going to be a big liability for the industry too, if you think about it. You think about the scale of asbestos. You know, asbestos was a great thing for insulation. Um, but, um, you know, everybody who made asbestos has now gone bankrupt because of all the class action lawsuits for asbestos damage. And so the question is, are LED lighting manufacturers are creating a nightmare for themselves by pushing ahead when now the science is fully developed in pumping out blue rich LED lights, static blue rich, in other words, ones that don't change by time of day. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. The, um, just a couple other questions. I won't hold you too much longer, but, um, in terms of, let's say, the, 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 you know, creating that circadian lighting for inside, uh, th things that strike me are um, trying to replicate day daylight. And and obviously you're, you're sort of saying, is it that 475 or 476, that sky blue is is the real sort of um, the real wavelength that that sort of that triggers, you know, the SCN and that and and, and really sort of helps govern our, our circadian cycles. But there's infrared and there's ultraviolet and there's UVA, B, C, A, B, and C that I think that are in daylight that that help to help us as well, isn't there? Like in the morning, I think, that, and I've been doing it myself for the last like um, three or four months, and I find that yeah, God, I sleep so much better. But getting up and seeing the sunrise, um, there's certain invisible spectrums that are outside of the visible spectrum, but yeah. it's the infrared on one side. And the UVA, UVB, I think, um, on the other side. I've seen some light bulbs that are trying to replicate that element of it as well. But like we've lost that because the old Edison light bulb had a lot of infrared. I know there's a, a lot of infrared therapy out there now. You know, it's it's there's this huge benefits being seen from it. But it, that's challenging. It, like there's there's a degree of there's a degree of we're trying to understand how best to advise our you know our, our clients and that a lot of it as i'm saying is you definitely need to get outside uh we, we can minimize the damage we do inside <laughs> with our interior lighting but yeah. there, there are those other aspects to daylight isn't there and and there there is yeah. there is probably a challenge or maybe you know there's a complexity to try and replicate that 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you can't. I mean, the, first of all, obviously, the brightness of indoor light is just a mere fraction of what you get outside, right? Because you yeah. can't, to, you could not tolerate um, 50,000 lux or 100,000 lux like you get outdoors on a sunny day. Um, you couldn't tolerate inside. We're dealing with, you know, best 500 lux, you know, illumination, for example, um, indoors. But basically, the, the, yes, you're right. The various parts of the spectrum are critical for health. So, uh, for example, um, the green part of the spectrum is actually now being found to be a very effective in relieving pain and migraines, for example. The red part of the spectrum, as you may know, will grow your hair if you're getting a little bold on here. It also involved in cell repair and growth, right? Um, the um, the ultraviolet, the violet part of the spectrum, down about 405, 420 range, is very good at killing bacteria um, and uh, and viruses. Um, so you know there is a huge health, wide health benefit. And then of course you've got the infrared. And people always used to argue that um, the lighting industry would be arguing that the classic incandescent light bulb is only 12 percent light and 88 percent, you know. Yeah. I, I argued that. I used to argue that. <laughs> the trouble is that's healthy. You know, the trouble is there's, we're now understanding there's healthiness to that too, right? So, and, and that's part of it. We're messing with it. We're doing something. We fool ourselves that just by providing light to see, that's all you need. But light has to be for health, and that's the key. And so, yes, get outside because that's the only sure way um, of getting the dosage of what you need and the people who spend more time outside, the better. Um, and yes, people say, oh gosh, people are going to get skin cancers, but that's a very minor problem. It, you know, people live longer outside, even if there is a slightly higher risk of some skin cancers. But how you avoid that, by the way, is getting out in the morning, early morning, or at least before noon, before the sun's at its highest peak. Um, that's why it's so effective getting out in the morning. Is, yeah. is it in the morning, the infrared in the morning or the, the wavelengths of light in the morning prepares your skin for later in the day or something like that, isn't it? Yeah. Some of it, yes. I, you know, the infrared is a different issue, but but the, uh, the certainly you're not getting the uh, intensity of what, in fact, is going to cause um, some of the skin and other problems okay. in the morning. And in the morning is when your lights are going to boost your health. I mean, one really fascinating study to me is looking at psych people with psychiatric conditions, um, you know, bipolar, manic depression, uh, depression, so forth, hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital. Half the rooms were facing southeast. The other half of the rooms were facing northwest. Those that were put into the rooms that were southeast facing, therefore they got morning light, yeah. were discharged in 50% in half the time. Right, yeah, yeah. they got out. Yeah. They got out twice as fast as the ones who were in, and they all got the same medication and doctor treatments and therapy and all the other stuff, right? But they yeah. once once went in the, had light in the morning, sunlight coming in the morning, um, were you know got better in half the time. Staggering, yeah. staggering. It is staggering. Yeah. yeah, it's um. There's so many different areas and there's probably a lot of different areas that we don't even, I suppose, a, a little bit of humility. I think maybe partly part of our problem, I believe, sometimes is that we vastly overestimate what we know, you know, <laughs> uh, that nature is so incredibly intelligent. And um, and a lot of the time we, we presume we, we completely understand it. But like I, it, it just seems to affect in so many different areas, like you're saying. But if you sleep in dark rooms, there's additional benefits in terms of, you know, living longer. If you're outside during the day, there's studies showing you live longer. And and obviously for the likes of the hospital study you're talking about there. So there's just so many, you know, it just seems ac across the board, you know, obviously natural daylight is so, so important. But then like and I suppose I think I know you do a good bit of consultancy for the likes of night shifts. There's certain areas where artificial light, you know, where we where we we do, um, as I'm saying, we're trying to rationalize how best, you know, from a lighting design perspective, we can uh, we can tailor what we do. And, it, and it's trying to use probably warmer color temperature in the, in the evening. I'm talking to a lot of our, our manufacturers about, you know, sort of much more specific sort of circadian lighting and that type of thing. Um, that's looking at that 475 sort of nanometer um, and, and replicating what you guys are doing. But I know that you, 
particularly with the likes of night shifts and stuff uh, and that you, you consult in that and that and that's that's a challenge isn't it like how yeah. how best at night uh you know if people i suppose you know the message for people from a health point of view is is during the day getting outside but if 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 you have if if your job is a night shift and and how best how do you guys approach that in terms yeah. of trying to minimize the harms that that causes yeah, we've done a lot of work on that and actually developed lights for people working shifts and night shifts and so forth. And the answer is that the um, there is a body of people who say, oh, well, blue rich light is good because it makes you more alert. And it does alert people, make them less sleepy, right? Which is, you know, if you're working, it's a, it's a good thing. But the problem is you also really screw up your circadian clock and your health and disrupt your circadian rhythms and cause all sorts of ill health. So we've said, look, uh, what actually works better is to give blue rich light during the day, day shift, right? Day shifts, but in the evening shifts, as the sun sets, you switch over to light that is zero blue in color. It doesn't have any of this around 480 nanometer blue light, but we add to it a violet light um, that ran about 420 in the violet, which has no effect on the circadian clock, but number does two very interesting things. Number one, it whitens up the light, so it looks back like regular light again, not just really yellow-orange. It becomes regular-looking color light by adding violet in, use a violet LED. But we also, that violet turns out to be alerting, so that actually people with that violet are more alert less sleepy, perform better, have fewer errors on the night shift. And we've shown this now many times. Um, and with that, and it, with, so what you're doing is you're getting people alert on the night shift. You're getting good quality lighting that they can see and work properly with. And you're not disrupting their circadian rhythms in their sleep. And they're sleeping longer, both before night shifts and after night shifts. And we just did a big trial. And I mean, for example, in, uh, in the Netherlands and Dow Chemical did a big trial where we uh, put a year for a year. We studied people with this type of circadian lighting as compared to standard, you know, lighting before static lighting and big improvements in performance, health, everything, sleep as a result. Okay. So the answer is, yeah, it better to keep the circadian clock on schedule. Um, you will it, it better not disrupt the circadian clock. So keep it low and blue at night. But use a violet pump, um, violet type uh, enhanced light uh, that enables you to uh, um, maintain alertness and performance on that night shift so you don't have people falling asleep on the job. OK, OK. Um, listen, like it's it really interesting to chat and thanks for taking the time because it's just um, it's so good to hear it from the horse's mouth as such. You know, <laughs> I can tell people that the research is out there, but when I'm speaking to somebody that actually carried out the research, <laughs> it's very hard to, to deny it, you know, um, and especially for us is when you're trying to hit that message home and you're trying to make people, I think, as as we both said, awareness. Like, I, I think there's a few things. I think lighting's been commoditized a little bit, has been cheapened and undervalued. Um, we have an ability to uh, because it's become so cheap, we've sort of over, we're over lighting everywhere, you know, indoors, outdoors, everywhere. And we see it all the time. People coming into us with plans that would have down lights everywhere. Um, and we're just saying, you know, you need to whip out like 70 percent of those. You just don't need them, you know. Um, so it's probably not good from a sustainability perspective either. If we're trying to get lumens per watt, but we're we're putting an extra lighting because it's cheaper. <laughs> um but, that, but that's, also the irony, that's the irony is what you're not saving anything in the end because they, no, they you're not. Using, you know they're getting more light uh yeah. le less energy used per light bulb but more light you know, this is overall. it yeah it's causing curious. more problems yeah. and then you know it's just not having that holistic view viewpoint on it you know it's something that always struck with me when we were creating our space here, it was very much looked light as an emotional thing. Like actually yeah. in, in UCL it, during my master's, I looked at it because you talked about research um, and how research was all about visuals. And I, I won't hold you because we, we're, we've we been here a little while, but um, certainly when I look at light and design research, it was all based on lighting for the task. And uh, there was no real understanding of the emotional element or, or there's, you know, which there is an emotional element to it as well. But cer certainly the holistic, uh, you know, the whole holistic viewpoint, which is the emotional element, which is the visual task, but also the health, which is is huge, you know. So, um, yeah, 
look, it's all this is all part, I suppose. And I think I think what you're doing is fantastic. I, I actually think for anyone that that the 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 um the light doctor and substack is a great read and and the uh, you have a chapter coming out every couple of weeks or something really yeah. at, at this stage. Yeah. Um and just in terms of generating the awareness and making yourself available because um I do I do think I, and you're in that world, not not me, but it seems to me that a lot of the scientific world is is quite closed a little bit as well. And you know, researchers sort of um every community is closed. I think the, the light and design community is quite closed. We we talk to each other, but we don't talk to parallel professions and and yeah. The fact that you've been so public and open and um, and accessible and available, I think, is fantastic because because you've done the research, you know, you can speak with authority and you can really drive that message home. So um, well done on what you're doing, I suppose, is, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Good. Now, I appreciate all you're doing to get the word out because it just has to get word out to people like yourselves who are right in the middle of the lighting, you know, uh, uh, supply chain as it were and um and it's critical uh to get that word out and uh yeah no so it's great talking to you willie great questions and uh we'll do it again another time